So perhaps you've recently picked up the DJI Osmo Action 4, and maybe the first time using this camera, perhaps you took it out of the box, fired it up, started filming with it. Or maybe first you watched my complete beginner's guide and keyed in the settings on your camera, and you've been playing with it and been happy with the results. But at the same time, you might be asking yourself, is there more? In other words, is the DJI Osmo Action 4 capable of better footage? Dare you ask, is the DJI Osmo Action 4 capable of filming cinematic footage? What does cinematic mean anyway? I think the word cinematic could probably be interchangeable with several other terms. Perhaps professional, advanced, high quality, great looking. Wow, it came from a $399 camera. I think all of those terms could be interchanged with cinematic. And ultimately with this video today, I want to help you wring every last bit of creative potential and quality out of this camera that you can. I want you to be able to use the Osmo Action 4 to fulfill that creative vision that you have and get the most that you can out of a $399 camera. Now, is this little camera right here going to get you the type of footage that you can get out of something like this right here? Maybe not. But I have to say, after playing with the DJI Osmo Action 4, this $399 camera can actually come surprisingly close to a camera like this one that cost $10,000 new. It's amazing what this tiny little action camera can do. So let's get into it and let's figure out what it takes to get the best, highest quality, most cinematic footage out of the DJI Osmo Action 4. So the first thing you'll need to understand is the exposure triangle and how that pertains to videography. So with the exposure triangle, you have three different variables. You have aperture, you have ISO, and you have shutter speed. Now the first variable aperture is static on this camera. It has an aperture of f2.8 and you cannot change that aperture. So right there you have one of the three variables that's already set for you. You can't adjust it, you have to work with it. The second variable ISO is adjustable. You can adjust the ISO in this camera from 100, way, way up, I think 12,800. But don't go into those high zones. The sensor in the Action 4 is much bigger than the Action 3. But once you get beyond about ISO 1600, the noise and grain in that footage pretty much renders it unusable. So we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but ISO values are adjustable on here. And there's going to be a certain specific way of setting those that I recommend that I'll get into in a little bit. And finally, the third variable is shutter speed. Now, this is where there's a lot of heated debate when it comes to cinematic. When you see footage on that movie screen, you're generally going to see footage that was filmed in probably 24 frames per second. And that 24 frames per second footage is generally going to have a shutter speed of one over 48. With a lot of cameras, even Hollywood expensive cameras, your shutter speed, you can't always set it to one over 48. It's often going to be one over 50, but that is fulfilling the 180 degree shutter rule. And that 180 degree shutter rule is basically that the shutter speed is twice the frame rate with a one and a slash in front of it. So that means with 24 frames per second, it's one over 48 or one over 50. If you're watching something that's 30 frames per second, which a lot of TV shows are, that's gonna be a shutter speed of one over 60. And if something was filmed in 60 frames per second, it's gonna have a shutter speed of one over 120. And the reason that shutter speed matters is it keeps the motion blur very pleasing to the eyes. So this brings me to the next question that you might have. If you've tested it out on your camera, you might notice that when you set your shutter speed to twice your frame rate, your footage is super blown out and overexposed. Thankfully, there is a remedy for that. And what you need is you need sunglasses for your Osmo Action 4. More specifically, you need ND filters. Freewell has already created ND filters for the Osmo Action 4. Now, if you owned the Osmo Action 3 and had ND filters for it, Unfortunately, those will not work with the Osmo Action 4. The Osmo Action 4 lens is just slightly different here. So if you try to take this off and thread those on, it's not quite the same size of thread and it won't work. But the great thing about these brand new ND filters from Freewell is these ones are a much larger design. And with these ones, you don't have to unscrew or screw on the lens cap or anything like that. These just pop on put them on there, you're good to go. So these are what you need to perfect that exposure triangle and to expose your footage as you want it to be. 
when we look at our settings, I'm going to get into a lot more depth with that. The other tool I recommend is a gimbal. A gimbal is a tool that you can use to mechanically stabilize your camera without needing to have the stabilization in the camera turned on. In this case, that's called Rocksteady on the Osmo Action 4. Now, the reason Rocksteady can create problems is because when you're doing that 180 degree shutter rule and you have your shutter speed set to twice the frame rate, that's a very slow shutter speed and those individual frames are not crisp and sharp. And when you're working with electronic image stabilization, which Rocksteady is, it really needs those crisp, sharp frames to function properly. If you don't have those crisp, sharp frames, you're gonna get a lot of ghosting and jitter in your footage, and your footage is going to look really bad. So what I do recommend to really get the best out of this camera, if you wanna do that cinematic motion blur, is you do need a gimbal. Now gimbals, there are a ton of options out there that you can technically use with the Osmo Action 4. You can get a lower cost gimbal like the iSteady Pro, and that gimbal goes for about $90, and you can mount your Osmo Action 4 on there, and you can use it to stabilize. Now this gimbal is what I would call good. It's not going to get you the best results. There's still going to be quite a bit of movement to the footage that you would then have to stabilize later on, either using the gyro data, which is available in certain modes on here, not all, We'll talk about that later as well. So I do recommend having a gimbal if you're going to have your shutter speed anything slower than about one over 200. Now this gimbal is what I would call better. This one is the Moza Mini P Max. And this gimbal is a little bit more powerful. The Moza Mini P Max can accommodate up to about 2.21 pounds. And what's nice is a gimbal like this you can use with your action cameras, your phones, or some smaller mirrorless cameras. This one is a little more versatile and it can easily handle the weight of an action camera. And then there's also the gimbal that I would call best. And that gimbal is the DJI RSC2. Now this one is a little bit older. DJI has come out with some newer models of this, but the newer models do cost quite a bit more. So this one honestly is significant overkill for this little camera. But you can see here, I have mounted it and used it on here and super easy to balance. I at first was concerned that this camera might not weigh enough for this to properly stabilize it, but worked great, no problems there. This I believe you can get for around $300 now, a little bit over that, but the RSC2 can support up to like six pounds or maybe a little bit higher. So I use some of my Sony mirrorless cameras on here. So I already had this gimbal for those, but if you think you're gonna use other larger cameras, this gimbal you can't go wrong with. I love it. It's got a lot of functions on it and it's really easy to use and just simple. It gets the job done and it stabilizes footage well. When it comes to gimbals, good, better, best. And I of course will link to all these in the description below in case you wanna check out any of them for your filming purposes. So ND filters and gimbals are two tools that I do recommend you pick up if you really want to get the very best creative potential out of the Action 4. But if you don't want to invest in those tools and you don't care about that cinematic motion blur, you could technically set the minimum shutter speed on here to one over 200. And that way the shutter speed would not go lower than that. And you could get by with using Rocksteady. Now your frames are gonna be a lot sharper. They're not gonna have that real pleasing motion blur, but there are techniques where you could add the motion blur later on. You don't have to use the mechanical gimbal but the ND filters you probably will find useful because as you'll see in a little bit, it's still ideal to have a static shutter speed. And that's so that the lighting in each of your scenes is not changing. When the lighting in your scene stays the same throughout the entire scene, it gives that footage a much more cinematic and professional look. For example, take a look at this scene where I took the Osmo Action 4 underneath this bridge where it went from bright sunlight to the shadows and then back to bright sunlight. If I had some type of auto setting there where one of those three settings changed, in this case it would be the shutter speed or the ISO to adjust for the lighting. When I walk under that bridge, the lighting's going to get much brighter. And then when I walk back in the sunlight, it's gonna re-expose it again. But with the static settings, I think it looks a whole lot better when I can go under there and the lighting is more realistic. It stays the same. It looks more like it actually looks. 
But when you do it with all three settings static, which again, you only have to change two, the ISO and the shutter speed, I think it looks a whole lot better. So that's what we're gonna talk about today in the best settings section, which we're gonna look at right now. So the great thing is to get that cinematic footage, you don't have to tweak a whole lot of settings on your camera. And sometimes you're going to have to play around with those values a little bit to find that perfect exposure for your scene. And the perfect exposure is going to relate to a lot of factors. First of all, what time of day is it? Is it sunny out? Is it cloudy out? What direction are you facing? Are you facing toward the sun? Are you facing away from the sun? Which by the way, helpful tip. In general, I don't recommend facing the sun unless that's part of your creative vision for your production. If you have a scene where you need to face the sun, like for a sunset or something like that, or your subject is heading toward the sun and you have to film that way, you can do that. But ultimately, the footage is going to look the best if the sun is behind you or if the sun is at a 45 degree angle over either of your shoulders. The lighting is going to be optimal when filming. But at the same time, the great thing about setting these static values is you can still properly expose your scene and your subject, even if you're looking into the sun. So let's take a look at these settings. So I recommend setting up two different modes here. The first mode I recommend is a mode where you just want the normal speed in your finished production. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure you're in video mode. And for that, I recommend doing the 4K 4x3 in 24 or 25 frames per second, depending on what country you live in. In the United States, I recommend setting that to 24 and I do recommend doing the 4K 4x3. That way you're utilizing the entire sensor and you have room later on to vertically adjust that footage. You can even add movement to it. So it adds some panning flexibility, which can be another component of cinematic footage that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. And you also want to make sure that rock steady is off if you're going to be using the cinematic 180 degree shutter rule. If you're not, you can leave rock steady on and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Next, we're gonna go over here to these parameters and you wanna make sure Pro is turned on here because there's gonna be key settings here that we need to plug in. First one we wanna go to is exposure here and for 24 frames per second, you wanna set the shutter speed to one over 50 and ISO as much as possible, you wanna have it at 100. Now, what I love about the Osmo Action 4 is it shows the EV value up here. So you can use that value up here as kind of a guide to how you need to expose the footage to make sure it's properly exposed. Now, currently I am inside and it's fairly dark. So right now I am underexposed by about 1.7. That would be bad. We don't want to underexpose by that much because later on our footage is gonna be dark. And if we try to brighten it, there's gonna be a lot of noise in that footage. It's gonna be baked into it. So what I would do in that case, if I was outside and it was like that, with the EV negative 1.7, we would want to boost the ISO. So in this case, boosting it to 400 puts us at about plus 0.3. You do want to aim for as close to zero as possible, but if you're in the negative 0.3 to plus 0.3 range, you're generally gonna be fine. That footage is gonna be very gradable later on and it's not gonna be a problem. With ND filters, if it's a cloudy day outside, you're probably gonna wanna use about ND8 and that's probably gonna let you adjust these parameters as you need to without needing to do anything extreme with the ISO. If it's a sun and clouds day out, you're probably gonna wanna start with ND16. And potentially if it's really bright, you're gonna want ND32 or ND64. But remember for the 180 degree shutter rule, you wanna set your shutter speed to twice the frame rate first. And then at that point, the only value you need to adjust is the ISO over here. But the goal you wanna aim for as much as possible is have that ISO at 100 with the exposure as close to zero as possible in the negative three to plus three range. That's your ultimate goal there with properly exposing it. Now, after you do that, you wanna hit confirm and you'll want to check that exposure before each of your scenes. If you're changing direction, uh, let's say for one scene, you're facing away from the sun, but the next scene you're facing toward the sun your exposure is definitely going to need to be changed relative to that. For the white balance, I highly recommend setting a static value here. In general, if I'm outside in the daytime, I like to do 5,000K. That's usually gonna be pretty close to accurate and it's gonna help ensure it's not too warm or too cool. And the one thing I would say is if you are outside at sunrise or sunset filming a scene, it's generally helpful to put the white balance a little higher 
somewhere up in the 6,500 to 7,000 range. Under color, that's a really key setting. Getting cinematic footage, a lot of that magic happens with the grading later on, which I am going to show you a grading process with sample clips from this camera. But you want to make sure it's set to D log M right there. That's going to give you the 10 bit flexibility. And that D log M is a flat color profile where it's going to look very flat without much uh, contrast or color in it. But later on, when you grade it, you're going to be able to add that contrast and color and really set the mood of your footage. And that's what we want. A lot of the cinematic storytelling is the mood you set in the footage. You can set the mood to match your story. For field of view, you do have options here. I recommend wide. And the reason for that is wide is the only mode that gyro data is available in with the Rocksteady off. So that's the reason I like wide. And you can correct that distortion later on if you want to. But wide also gives you more of that full sensor readout. If you do standard D-warp, it's not the same focal length and there is a little bit of a crop there, so you're missing out on some of that footage. So I like to do wide for those reasons. And then for image adjustment down here, I like to keep noise reduction at zero and I like to set sharpness to either negative one or negative two. In other words, we don't want footage that's overly sharp because we can always add sharpness when editing. That's real easy to do. So if you go down to negative two, that is the lowest, lowest sharpness. I usually keep this a negative one because I find that for a lot of scenes, that little bit of sharpness there is not too much. And I usually don't have to add much or any sharpness later on. And if there is audio in your scenes to get cinematic footage, I don't recommend using the mic from this camera. So I'm not even going to go through those. I do recommend using a wireless external mic. I would also like to show you my slow motion recommendations which would be 4K, 4x3, 60 frames per second if you're in the United States. If you're not in the United States, then I would recommend doing 50 frames per second. And then over here, the only setting that we have to change differently is we need to adjust our shutter speed. We would want to set that to 1 over 120 so that it's double the frame rate. And that 1 over 120, you can see we're even further underexposed because 1 over 120 is a faster shutter speed and a faster shutter speed means less light is let into the camera. If you're doing 60 frames per second and you have ND16 on the camera, you'll probably find you could go down to ND8. And then you also might find you might have to do some ISO tweaks here to get that properly exposed. In this case, without an ND filter in this lighting, we'd have to go all the way up to ISO 800. And then if you want to, you can save some presets and you would do that by going up here and you can save them to any of your existing preset options that you have available. So my cinematic preset is number one right there because that's the one I find myself using most, the 4K24. And I've got all the settings keyed in so I can easily toggle to that and use it with no problems. And then gyro data is available in the following settings. 2.7K or 4K, 4x3, 24 to 60. Or 2.7K, 4K, 16x9, 120. So that's another reason to use the 4K 4x3. That's where you get the gyro data. And it's good to have that available because if you do need to use it, you can use Gyroflow, which is a free program, and you can add stabilization to your footage later on. It does quite a good job. If you don't want to have to use a manual gimbal, you want to be able to use your camera like this with the Rocksteady on, you can't get the cinematic motion blur, but you can still do static settings. So. Let's go back here to 4K, 4x3, 24, and let's turn Rocksteady on. A key that we need to keep in mind is the following. When we're setting our settings here, you still want to do static settings. It's still going to help the light not change in your scene, but you want to make sure your minimum shutter speed is at least one over 200. If you do that and you have Rocksteady on, you shouldn't have any problems with jittery or ghosting footage. So you could still use ND filters because on a bright sunny day, if you have the shutter set to one over 200, it's probably still going to be way overexposed. Oftentimes the auto shutter speed on a bright day is going to be like closer to one over 1000. So ND filters, I still recommend picking those up because you want to be able to set that static shutter speed. So now that we've talked about the tools and best settings for cinematic footage, let's talk a little bit about technique. Now technique, there are a lot of different options in this, but there are some general techniques that are going to give you 
the best, most cinematic looking footage. Consider the movies you've watched. Think about how the camera moves in those, how the camera's positioned, how the subject is positioned. There's a lot to think about and study there, but generally the camera movements are going to be fairly even and there's going to be a variety of them. If you think about it, most movies, there's some type of motion at all times in a scene. Sometimes that motion is slower with some type of crop on the scene or some type of movement of the camera in and out. Other times the movement is faster, like if it's an action scene, there's gonna be a lot of fast movement, a lot of motion blur in that scene. In addition, a lot of scenes in movies or television are going to have close-ups of a subject and they're also going to have those wider establishing shots. Using a variety of these and using them strategically is going to help you tell your story well and it's going to help keep your audience interested. So I do recommend before you go out to film with your Osmo Action 4, think about it and plan out your scenes. It's important to plan out what type of scenes you want to film so that you have a lot of footage to work with when you get back. I recommend always over filming so that you have enough footage to tell your story versus getting home and wishing you had filmed that scene that you didn't film. It's a terrible feeling. You don't wanna have that feeling. You wanna make sure you get plenty to work with and that way you have a lot of flexibility to pick those very best scenes that tell your story well. Now in addition, when you're doing editing, you can also add motion to a scene. You don't have to do it all with your camera. You can easily go in and out with the camera. That's the great thing about 4K footage. You have some flexibility with cropping it, especially when you do the 4K 4x3. You've got a lot of extra footage vertically that you can work with. And in general, when you're exposing your scene before you film it, it's helpful if you keep the camera moving in the same direction relative to the sun. So if the sun is behind you, it's helpful if you continue facing away from the sun and don't do some type of pan around like a 360 because your exposure is going to change dramatically with the sun at your back versus facing into the sun. So keep that in mind. And again, a lot of pleasing lighting angles can be at that 45 degree angle. So use the sun to your advantage. And another important point to make is the Osmo Action 4 does have a minimum focal distance. So don't make the mistake of getting this too close to your subject. I recommend keeping it back at least two feet. Otherwise your subject is going to be out of focus and it's not going to look good. And that footage will not be usable later on. You won't like the footage. You'll probably hate it when you see it and you'll probably be upset you didn't hold the camera further away from the subject. So make sure to hold it back about two feet. Just to be safe, I usually do like three feet because sometimes I feel like two feet isn't enough for that optimal sharpness of the subject. So to be even safer, go for three feet. Which brings me to the final portion of this video and that is the editing portion. I debated, should I do a whole separate video on the grading and editing? But I thought about it and I decided to include it in this video because we are talking about getting cinematic footage from the Osmo Action 4. And one of the key components to getting that cinematic footage is knowing how to grade it and edit it properly. So I'm going to give you a tutorial here on how I grade footage from this camera. I'm going to use Adobe Premiere Pro but those same principles will carry over to other video editors. I'm using Adobe Premiere Pro because it is the one I'm most familiar with, and I do love the Adobe products, but you could use DaVinci Resolve, you could use Final Cut Pro, you could use iMovie. Now, some of these features are going to go by different names and have different layouts, so it's not all going to look the same as it does in Premiere Pro, but getting a basic understanding of how to grade the footage, it's not as hard as it might sound, it's going to be really helpful to you no matter what editor you use. So what I have here is I have three sample clips that I filmed on the Osmo Action 4, and I've imported these into Adobe Premiere Pro. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some grading on these. And I'm also going to show you how you can reframe those four by three clips if you really wanna get some vertical adjustments done on the 16 by nine timeline. Now this timeline that I have here, it is of course a uh, 4K, 23.976, 24 frames per second timeline, 3840 by 2160. So it is a 4K timeline with 4K footage. First things first, when color grading, you wanna make sure if you're using Adobe Premiere Pro that you have your Lumetri color tab over here. If you don't see this, no worries. You can go up here to window, workspaces, and make sure this is set to color. 
And if you still don't see it, go down and click reset to save the layout. And that should add it. But if that still doesn't add it, go over here to this list right here and simply select Lumetri color, make sure it's checked and it'll show over here. Next thing I recommend doing when you're doing a project like this is I recommend adding an adjustment layer. To add an adjustment layer, go up here to File, New, and click Adjustment Layer. And you can keep the defaults here. It's gonna detect your uh, timeline settings. And then once you have that, take that and drag it here under your timeline. And I'm gonna zoom this in a little. The reason I recommend the adjustment layer is you can make all of your grading adjustments to that layer right there. And then you can take this layer and you can put it over top of all of your other clips for your project. And you can have all of those grading settings that you did on that one clip that you can easily apply to the other clips. Now that's one way of doing it. You also can copy the attributes that you've changed and paste them onto another clip if you want to. But I find that adjustment layer is just a little bit easier to keep track of the settings. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, one more thing we need to set up. Up here where it says Lumetri Scopes, you wanna make sure you have this available because this is going to be a really useful tool when color grading. So when you're color grading, yes, you can visually look at things and see how they look, but this is gonna kinda of be that scientific way of making sure that your eye is not deceiving you. It's gonna be a way to make sure that your footage is truly looking good and that it's going to look good when your audience sees it. And one other thing to check really quick, if you are on Windows or even on Mac, make sure that your night light, if you have that on, is turned off. Because if you have that night light on, it's going to make everything much warmer looking than it actually is. And you wanna make sure you're grading accurately. Now this monitor I have here, it's an LG, and it does allow me to see the uh, entire color gamut, which is good because this D-Log M is 10-bit footage. If you don't have a monitor that allows you to do that, no worries. You can still do grading. It may not be as precise, but you can still get really good looking footage. All right, so let's get started on this clip. So in this Lumetri color tab over here, there are three sections here that we're going to use for the grading. And that's going to be the basic correction, the curves, and a little bit of the color wheels and match, and possibly a little bit under the creative but it's gonna primarily be basic curves and color wheels. And I'm going to start with the curves here. So curves is actually where we're going to do the majority of our grading. And to explain what these curves mean, in case you haven't used these before, this curve is going to basically allow you to adjust the contrast of all of the colors in your scene. The white one is. The reason it's called RGB is over here we have red, green, and blue RGB. And when you get to these, this is gonna kind of allow you to subtly fine tune those colors in your footage, the reds, the greens, and the blues, which those three colors are the primary colors that make up all the colors in our footage. But most of the work is gonna be done under the white. And to make this simple here, what we wanna do is we wanna go through and make three dots. And we wanna make those dots wherever the lines cross this way over the white line. We're gonna click here, we're gonna click here in the center, and we're gonna click here at the top. So what these zones represent here is this zone down here is the shadows in your footage. This is the midtones, and this is the highlights. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a drag here to show you what happens when we do this. So if we drag this down here, you can see a lot of those blacks being brought out in our shadows. It's making our shadows a lot darker and more contrasty. And what I'm gonna use as a guide is I'm going to look over here at my Lumetri scopes. Now, when I'm grading for the shadows, I wanna make sure these lines here do not drop below zero. If they do, I'll give you an example here. If they do drop below zero, we're losing details in our shadows. We're gonna be putting our shadows too dark and we're gonna be losing detail there. And that's going to not look good. So when grading that, we want to make sure we don't have any place on this line over here that goes below zero. And it's not a problem to keep it above zero either, but the default starting point was about right here. And as you can see, we definitely wanna bring down those shadows a little bit. Now, the thing I like to mention with grading is we're going for subtle here. So you don't have to do drastic changes to D log M, which this footage is D log M to get it to look good. 
Oftentimes, those subtle changes are going to be all you want to do, and the subtle changes can make a huge difference. So what we're gonna do here with the highlights is we're gonna go up a little bit, because as you can see over here, we don't really have any highlights that are blown out, except a little bit here toward the center of our image, which is gonna represent the sky right up here, which makes sense, the sun is right above there, so that is the brightest part of the footage. So we're gonna take this and we're gonna drag it up, and this is gonna bring up our highlights a little bit, and I like it right about there. We're still not blowing anything out, but it already adds a lot more contrast to our original image than we did have. With the midtones, I usually bring that up just a little bit to make it just a little bit brighter. And I like that right about there. So once we've made our adjustments with the white tier, we wanna go and make a few more adjustments with the red, the green, and the blue to give it that little bit more cinematic look. So we're gonna do the same thing click our dots here. And with the red, I'm gonna bring that down ever so slightly. And as you can see, that's gonna kind of make it a little bit more green there. That's a common cinematic technique there. A lot of that cinematic look is going to be found in this one. But at the same time, if you brought this up, it's gonna give it kind of more of that retro -y feel to it. A lot of this part is preference. What kind of look are you going for in your footage? You know, if you want more of that retro -y look, you probably want to bring this up a little bit. If you want a little bit of that more modern cinematic look, you might want to bring this down just a little bit. I'm going to bring it down ever so slightly. For midtones, I'm going to leave that alone here. And then for highlights, I'm going to bring this up ever so slightly here. And then we're going to go over here to green and I'm going to click here again with the dots. And if you do ever want to go back with the curves, by the way, all you have to do is double click on the line and the dots will disappear and it will default and reset to the initial default setting. So I'm gonna click on my green line here and I'm gonna do a couple adjustments here as well for the greens. So if you go up here, it makes it not a good color with, with this uh, line with the green, I like to bring it down ever so slightly for the greens. And then for the highlights, I'd like to bring it ever so slightly up. With the blue, I'm gonna bring this down just a little bit. And right here, bring it up just a little as well. And I like how that looks right there. So a couple other things we can do here. If we wanted to change the, uh, the shade of the sky or some other prominent color in our footage, what we can do here on the hue versus saturation, you can click this little eyedropper and you can click part of the blue sky up here. So I'm gonna click right there and you're gonna see the dots appear here. So we're gonna drag these dots sideways here just to give ourselves a little more room. And what we're gonna do here is we can change the hue slightly. This is gonna help give it a little bit more of a cinematic look also. So I'm gonna bring that up just a little bit here and that's gonna saturate that sky a little bit more. So we're kind of selectively saturating that, but I like how that looks. And then I think I also want to slightly saturate these railings on the bridge, this color. So I'm gonna click there, and that's gonna bring us over here more to the reddish tones. I drag these sideways a little bit, and we're gonna drag that up a little bit as well. I kind of like the contrast that those offer in the scene. And then if we want to change our hue slightly, what we can do is we can go here and click on this dot. And I'll show you what that does. And again, you don't have to do any of this if you don't want to. The main part is the curves here where most of the magic happens, but you see that when I do that, it kind of changes that blue. Now, I, do, I don't like that, that's too much there. But if you want a little bit of a subtle change, you could bring that up just a little bit. And same thing with our red here. Go here, click on the dot, go back down here, drag these dots sideways a little bit to give ourselves some room. And I'm gonna drag this up just a little bit. All right, so that, that is the grading aspect with the curves. And if you wanna see what we've already done to the footage already, you can uncheck this. And you can see that that's what it started as. And that's where we're at right now. There's a lot more contrast and color to that image. And it looks a lot better 
already. So the next part of this we want to do is the color wheels and match. Now typically with shadows, I don't really adjust the color much. I like to leave the shadows alone with the color. But midtones and highlights, I like to do a little bit of adjusting. So to adjust, what you do is you click here in the middle on that plus sign and you can drag it up here. It's going to give you a little bit more of that, those red tones to the overall look of the footage with the midtones. If you go down here, it's going to be a little more of that colder blue. Over here is a little more of that green. And then up here is going to be a little bit warmer. Now, again, subtle is best. You don't want to make drastic changes here. But I think for this particular grade, I want to bring out a little bit more of those reddish, pinkish midtones. So I'm going to drag it ever so slightly up that way. And if you do decide to go back, all you have to do is just double click on the plus sign and it'll revert back to the center. And highlights are where I want to make a little bit of a change as well. So highlights, I kind of want to have those match my midtones. I want to go a little more in uh, that warmer reddish direction. So I'm going to kind of go right up in this area and I'm going to leave that right there. So we are almost done with our grade. We just want to go up to the basic correction now and kind of make some fine tuning here. So if we want to make this overall scene a little bit warmer still, we can take this yellow up that way. Or if we want to make it a little bit cooler, we can go down that way. Now with the grading tools we have here, I already like how it looks. I don't feel like we really need to adjust the color temp much. It might go ever so slightly warmer, like 2.6 here. And then sometimes you'll want to adjust the tint. But usually the, the grading is where you're going to have adjusted that on the curves and the color wheels. So in this case, I'm going to leave the tint alone. And then here under exposure, we don't really need to change exposure. If you look over here on the Lumetri scopes, our exposure looks really good. We're right between that 0 and 100. And I like how it looks in this. So saturation, in this case, it is a little bit flat. So I recommend bringing that up a little. Here's where subtle is going to be great as well. So usually if I'm shooting with D-Log-M on the Osmo Action 4, I'm going to go between about 110 and 120 for the color. And I think in this case, I like that 120. I really like how that looks here. If I go back a little bit, you can kind of see. I feel like that's not overly saturated, but I really like how it makes the water stand out, the blue color and the reflection of that train bridge in the water looks really good there. So I'm going to keep it at 120 and I'm pretty happy with that saturation. And then finally, we're going to go down here to creative. And this is where we need to decide, do we want to bring up the sharpness a little bit? Of course, right here along the railing, if I play this, you can see that motion blur and that's that's what we're going for. But the scenes where we're not close to it and there's not motion like that train bridge and that ridge over here, we need to ask ourselves, do we think that should have more sharpness or do we like how it looks? Personally, I think I like how it looks. When I filmed it, I used the negative one for the sharpness, which already has a little bit. So I'm not going to add any sharpness here. I really like how that looks right there. So we're going to play through our clip now, see how that looks here. And of course, when I was going along with my camera, I lifted it up gradually as I was going along just to give a little bit of movement to that scene. And by the way, I really like when you get here toward the end. I love the shadows of this bridge on the water too. The Osmo Action 4 definitely picked up a lot of great detail here. And I love that cinematic motion blur along the side railings there. So the other aspect of this I wanted to show you is this clip right here. We're going to go over to effect controls. If we were to drag the position vertically, if you look with this clip, we can actually we have room to adjust. And that's because we shot this in four by three. So eventually, you know, it cuts out there at the top, but we also can adjust down there. Now, this clip is centered when you're at 1080 here. And in this case, I think that clip looks great at the 1080, but you do have room to adjust it vertically. So what we could do here, and I'm going to show you, let's start it off at about 750 down here at the bottom of the clip. And we're going to start here at the beginning at 750. And we're going to add a scale in position. And those are going to keep it set to that. But then we can actually add some additional motion here. 
So I'm gonna go all the way to the end of the clip. I'm gonna find the last frame. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna drop another dot and I'm gonna have this go higher up. So I'm gonna have this pan up as we go along. So you, you can see right there, right around 1450, it cuts off. I don't necessarily wanna go up all that far. I wanna to go to about 1300. So let's go back and play that clip through now. And you can see the pan up that we just added. We just added motion to that scene that wasn't as pronounced before. So that is another technique you can do while editing, which is really cool. You also can zoom in at the same time. So let's go back here one more time. So the first point, the scale is 100. That's our default 4K zoom. But let's go to the final keyframe here. And let's say we wanted this to zoom in very gradually, about to 120 by the end of the clip. Now when we go back, play this through, you can see that slight zoom taking place as we go along. And at the same time, there's one other fun little adjustment we can make here. We could put the ending back to 100 and we could put the beginning to 120. So as I go along, it's actually going to zoom out and it's kind of a cool little effect. It's subtle, but it looks cool. So play around with it. It's your cinematic production. The main thing I wanted to show you here is the grading. It's gonna really depend on that effect you're going for as you tell your story. But keep in mind, you have a lot of options you can do here, whether it's in Premiere Pro or whatever editing program you select. So next, I wanna do a color grade on this clip. So this clip is what we could call our hero shot. This one has a person in it, my five-year-old son here. And we had a lot of motion blur going on in this shot. It's actually pretty cool going up the steps. You see a lot of that motion blur along the ground. One of those more uh, faster paced scenes. So when grading a clip like this, I recommend that you grade for the outside area where we set our exposure first. I don't recommend grading for this underneath here, unless this was going to be the focal point of this scene. But in this case, I'm going to, first of all, take this adjustment layer, I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to paste it right here, and I'm gonna drag it, so it covers our entire area. So, as you can see, this grade from this footage doesn't necessarily apply 100% to the scene. I think it looks pretty good overall, but we need to consult our Lumetri scopes just to make sure we like how it looks. So let's use this spot right here and let's go back to the scopes. So what I notice here is we have some stuff that's overexposed and underexposed because the lighting is different here. And I also probably had a different ND filter on right here. So what we wanna do for that is we wanna go down here to the curves and we wanna make some adjustments. First of all, down here, we're gonna bring up the shadows a little bit. We're gonna bring them up to about right there. Midtones, I'm gonna pretty much leave alone right here in the middle. Highlights, I'm gonna bring those down just a little bit. So next, we're gonna do some tweaks to the red, the green and the blue curves. So the red here, I'm gonna bring this up just slightly. And up here, I'm gonna bring it down ever so slightly, closer to the line in this case. For the green, I'm going to bring this down a little bit for this scene. I think that gives it a more cinematic look. Then up here, I'm gonna bring it up ever so slightly. And same thing for the blue. I'm gonna bring it down a little bit here. And up here, I'm gonna bring it up a little bit. And with our hue and saturation, uh, I'm gonna bring this down just a little bit here because the, the blues are pretty well pronounced in this, his shirt and the sky. And the red, I'm gonna bring down ever so slightly as well. And again, subtle is good. You can change your scenes to whatever you like here, whatever kind of look you're going for. And hue versus hue, if you see that, if I adjust it, that really changes the hue and in this case, I want his shirt to be pretty true to the blue color it is, so I'm gonna bring this back down almost to the line. 
And then the red here, one thing we want to make sure of is that skin tones look natural. We don't want the skin tones to look really green, really blue, something unnatural. So in this case, it's often helpful to have a little bit of red for the skin tones. Not, not to make somebody look like they're sunburned, but to have a little bit there. And I, I like how that looks. And then finally, we're going to go down here to the color wheels. We're going to make sure we like how everything looks there. So in this case, the mid-tones, I'm going to bring those a little bit closer. We're going to start at the center. That's kind of green there. I want to go a little bit red again and go right there. And highlights, we're going to reset those as well. And highlights, I'm going to bring up right about there. Really like how that looks. So let's check that clip out all the way through. Now this part, of course, is going to be dark. This is where our hero is going through his uh, dark tunnel under the train bridge. You can see that's going to be super dark. And that does keep it true to the scene of how it actually looked. And then he steps out into the light. And he climbs the steps here. Really love the contrast in that scene. Uh, if we take this and we go back and uncheck curves, like that's a drastic difference. I'll go back here to illustrate that too. Curves off, curves on. Big difference, we've really brought up the saturation. Uh, speaking of saturation, I almost feel like this is a little bit oversaturated here. I'm gonna go back to 110 for this scene, but I feel like that's a little bit dull, so I'm gonna go to 115. Perfect, I like that right there. And that is, of course, a very long scene. We probably would be cutting this one up. And if you did cut it up and you had the shadow scene separate from the normal lighting, you could, of course, make some tweaks there as well. Really like the shadows from the leaves on this concrete here as well, by the way. All right, and finally, one more scene here that I want to grade with you. And this one is completely different day, completely different lighting. Uh, this was filmed right around sunset, and it's a shot of a sunflower here. And this is one of those more uh, slow motion type shots. Really like this one. It really highlights the capabilities of the Osmo Action 4, in my opinion. A lot of good detail there captured in the sunflower, the underside of the leaves, the tree here, that wooden post. And I really like this. It's a creative shot, and I filmed it in 60 frames per second, put it on the 24 frames per second timeline, and this, of course, would represent 40% of the actual speed. So really like that, how that looks. So what I'm going to do for this is I'm going to drag up the adjustment layer. And we're going to have a new adjustment layer for this. Because the lighting from this is going to be totally different than the lighting here. Uh, so in this case, it's not worth copying over those settings because we're going to have to adjust a lot of them anyway. And the other thing I would mention here is we want to reframe this a little bit because I kind of want that sunflower to mostly be in the frame. So you can see we have a little bit of leeway up there and also quite a bit down here. So I'm going to kind of go right about there, uh, right around 1340. And we're going to stick with that. And I'm just going to drag ahead. And yeah, I like the framing of that really well. So. Let's kind of pick a middle part of the scene here to do our grading. So I'm going to pick this where we've got a good bit of the sky. We've got the flower here, and then we've also got the leaves. Those are all important elements in this scene, and we want to make sure we grade with all of those in mind. Let's go down here to our curves, RGB curves, put our dots on here and I accidentally clicked and dragged a little bit. When I clicked there, so I'm going to go back and unclick. All right, let's go to Lumetri Scopes. And we can see here, we've got a little bit we can work with down here in the shadows. So we can uh, bring out some contrast in those shadows a little. I'm gonna drag it to about right there. And then for the upper part, drag this up a little bit for our highlights. And then midtones, we're gonna bring out our midtones a little bit more as well. So. If we uncheck and recheck, we've already brought a lot of contrast to that scene. And I really like how that looks. 
Uh, let's do a little bit of work with our red curve here. Drag that red down a little bit and up a little bit up here. And same thing with the green. And again, subtle is best and also go for whatever you're creatively wanting for your color palette there. So in this case, I wanna do just slightly down on the green, not much, cause it's gonna mess a lot with our subject here. So ever so slightly, and then up a little bit up here and blue. Gonna go down a little bit on the blue here and up a little bit on the blue up here. All right, so now that we've done that, uh, we're gonna check our hue saturation curves, figure out do we wanna do some extra saturation here. I think I kinda do with the sky. The sky looks kinda washed out, but that is how the sky often looks when it's a clear sky at sunset. There's not really clouds to give any of those real vibrant colors. Uh, none of those reds, oranges, pinks, or purples. So I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna drag the blue dots over and we're gonna bring this up a little bit. Kind of gives the sky a little more of a pop there against the yellow. And I really like that yellow against the blue. Love how that looks. As far as the hue, I don't think I really wanna change the hue of that. I think I'm pretty happy with that, but I think I also want to saturate the yellow a little bit more. So we're gonna click here and we're gonna drag our dots a little bit each way to give us a little more room. And I'm gonna drag that up quite a bit. I really want that yellow to pop against the blue. And I really like that right there. That looks really good. So we're gonna get out of our curves now. And we're gonna go down here to color wheels. And we're gonna do a little bit of a boost here. So I think in this case, I wanna go a little bit warmer. And a little bit, a little bit of that red too. So I like that right there for the midtones. Highlight the same thing. Highlights are gonna go a little more toward the red, but not too far. We wanna keep it uh, right about there. And I'm gonna bring midtones down just a little bit. And let's try shadows, see what, uh, what we can do in the shadows. So the shadows are gonna be a lot of the, the leaves and the green on that sunflower. You can see here if we go green, that's uh, way too green. That's if we go warm, don't really like that. If we go red, definitely don't like that. Blue, same thing. So shadows, I'm gonna leave alone like I usually do. I like them right there. So basic correction, let's go up here, let's add some more saturation. Let's try 120. Uh, I think I like 120. I think that looks really good. Let's try 130 though, just to see. So I think 130 is actually okay too. I think I like that. It doesn't feel overdone. Uh, if we check the beginning of the scene there, I think I like that a lot. Uh, for this particular scene, I think it would benefit from a little bit of sharpening. So we're gonna go down here to creative and let's do 10 for the sharpening. All right, let's watch that through now. Love it. Love how it looks. That nice, smooth, even slow motion. Looks really good there. And if you wanna see at any time entirely what all of the work you've done to it looks like versus what it started at, go over here to the effects control, the metric color. Click here where it says FX and it'll show you toggle the effect on or off. So that's with it on, that's with it off. Check out the huge difference that that grading made. That's before and that's after. Love the after. The after looks so much better. And in this case, it really fulfills the vision of what I'm going for with this particular scene. So there you have it. There's my guide to getting the best, highest quality cinematic footage out of the DJI Osmo Action 4.